context. Um, it's supposed to be, you know, there, there, there should be some context sensitivity here, but you're, you know, but you're, you're dropping that context and, and literally changing the, you know, changing the grammar that you're actually implementing. All right, so we mentioned parse tree differentials earlier, um, and we're going to get into those in more detail now. So as I mentioned a couple times already, different protocol dialects, i.e. different implementations of the same protocol done by different teams, even if the protocol itself is written perfectly, unless you've got some test vectors, which we do. I mean, if you want to look for examples of where test vectors have been used and used well, crypto, crypto algorithms. If you want a new hash function, one of the things you have to do is provide a test vector so that somebody else who implements your hash function can provide it the test vectors that will produce output that match what they're supposed to. What we're suggesting people ought to do is provide a, a grammar that can be used to validate the parses that you've implemented. That should go with the RFC or this implementation spec or what have you. It doesn't. There's some, some RFCs that uh, do a little bit of this, but not in a complete all-encompassing way. So, as I said, even if your RFC is done perfectly, there's no ambiguity, you still have different teams implementing it, potentially going to do it differently, different tools being used, which may introduce stealth differences when you compile and so forth. Particularly, um, edge cases here are your friend as an attacker. This is why vagueness matters, and this is why you should be conservative in what you accept. However, even if your implementation is not vague and you're being conservative in what you accept, if you've got a different way of handling the input than the other guy, i.e., if the other guy's not being conservative in what he accepts, then he's got a problem. Because of the issue of composability, if you rely on him doing things right, you're in trouble. So, how do we actually leverage this to find attacks? This is easy, easier if you've got access to the source and you can actually look at the parsers. If you need to do this against a closed source binary, we're actually looking at implementing a tool in, inside Valgrind to do that, but our current methodology is to take the call graph and derive from the call graph the parse tree for a specific input. Uh, and we do it by hand and it totally sucks. If anybody saw Ben Nagy's talk uh, earlier today, I didn't actually catch it, but I, I'm planning on going and talking to him. Because, well, the, you know, the idea is to not do it by hand. That's what the Valorant right stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, so what, 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 Ben's group, what, what Ben's doing is, uh, is looking for, um, you know, he, he's basically doing a lot of fuzzing and then, and then tracing through call graphs to find out what makes things crash. This is, this is similar but different. <clears throat> so, you've got... Somehow, you've got your two different parse trees for your two different implementations. You want to look at them, find the points of difference, find the inputs that will get your code or get your, your input packets to those points of difference. It's basically get them parsed far enough that they have to be handled by the areas that differ. That's your weak point. That's your attack point. That is where you're going to have fun. Because everything after that now is an opportunity to confuse one or both of the implementations. You are able to perhaps get code past an IDS that emulates the target system, but does so in a slightly different way, if you're aware of what that way is. Because that way you can create a packet that's going to come in, be validated by the, S, the IDS, and then passed on to successfully attack the target. This, again, is the fundamental way that we did most of our X11.9 attacks, because we were able to take a malicious CSR, 
submit it to one implementation that went, oh, you're fine, you're fine, you're not malicious, you're cute and fuzzy, I'll sign you. And then we turn around, send it to the target, and the little buddy bears its fangs. Does everyone get that? Why parse tree differentials are a boon to smart fuzzing and are a big bright light on where your targets are. This does not guarantee that you're going to have an exploit in that point. It does not guarantee that there's not going to be stupider exploits somewhere else. But it is going to give you, particularly in instances where you're dealing with a huge application that's got thousands of lines of code, and if you just start chucking garbage at it with dumb fuzzers, you're going to be there forever. This gives you a way to narrow down where you want to be spending your time. It's an optimization for attackers. And furthermore, when you do find an attack like this, it's usually not a classic attack that most people have already heard, have of. Already heard of or there's an easy fix for. It's usually throwing a spanner in the works, and particularly for applications that are absolutely dependent on being able to speak to other implementations of the same protocol if it's a client-server model or if it's a you peer-to-peer know, -peer model where there's different implementations. When you're faced with an attack where the answer is do it incompatibly from everybody else, you've just put your target in a really bad situation because they can fix the bug and now be broken and they can't talk to anybody else. They can not fix the bug and be screwed or they can try to do a very messy, very prolonged vendor coordination approach to everybody fixing the bug in the same way, let's hope, so that there's not any, uh, any problems with compatibility. This is why we had all those 6509 attacks done in January, and we actually couldn't talk about them until August. And that was against an industry that already has a big, let's coordinate our security problems group, VeriSign has been very good about that. Uh, we actually only had to talk to VeriSign and Microsoft. They did the rest of the dissemination for us. Um, and it still took nine months. Yeah. Now let's imagine this is, this is browsers and web servers. <laughs> I can't even count the implementations that are out there. Well, yeah, because that tells you that you've, I mean, it tells you that you're going to probably be successful. Um, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, but you, you still have to figure out where, you know, how you're going to get in. Um, I mean, it's the... You've got this attack surface, but you, ha but you still have to find the places where, you know, w where you're actually going to trip over, over yeah. things. Just because yeah. it's not provably impossible to break into something, just because it's provably not impossible to break into something, doesn't mean that it's easy to break into something. And remember, remember what I said earlier. If everybody is doing something wrong in the exact same way, you're in better shape than you would be if, ever, if some people are doing it right and some people are doing it wrong. All right, um, so the, uh, as, as I also mentioned earlier, um, we're also working on, um, on the defense side, figure, uh, figuring out a specification for grammars that are both human readable and machine readable. Something that it's easy for just, you know, anybody, with, you know, any, anybody who's you know, thumbed through a, you know, a basic computability theory textbook to, or, you know, to, to write up some BNF that can then get parsed, um, you know, they're, 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 can then get fed into a parser generator, which generates code with, you know, uh, with with backend hooks in whatever language you want. Um, I'm working on something like this already um, in in Haskell, and once that actually works, then you know you've got the foreign function interface. And furthermore, um, parser combinators have been ported to a whole bunch of different languages, so it'll be it'll be easy to you know move that over to Java and .NET um, with you know and and hopefully thereby minimize the differences be, um, between implementations cross-platform. 
we were hoping to have some examples of new, and I was hoping to drop zero days here, but as I said, the coordination is quite difficult. But I, I expect that, first of all, I'll have zero days to show the next time I see you guys, uh, perhaps at, like at Europe next year, but I'm hoping that people in this room, people you know, if you point them at this talk, will start actually looking at this as a methodology for for finding areas of weakness. I don't. I don't. I don't well, spend. Mo I don't spend most of my time doing fuzzing and doing uh, exploit development. But some of you do. How much time do you spend just wasting, wa wasting your time while your fuzzers go through a million cycles trying to find an area where they can actually get something that's promising, or sitting through a reading code looking for looking for user mistakes. I will tell you we've got a head start on HTML5, but I would be thrilled to, to, to see some of you guys HTML, catch up to us and pass us. HTML5 is enough problems, <laughs> enough problems to feed everybody in this room. <laughs> all right, so any questions? Or did we get them all during the talk? Yes? So you had the three, three categories. Uh -huh. Is that just because three is a nice round number? Or? Yeah. Uh, you're, talking, you're talking about ambiguity, nonsense, and confused deputy? Yeah. Um, in general, um, those, have, those have been the categories that, that things those we've found have just fallen into. 95% of what you find falls I mean, those, into one of those. those are, they're pretty broad categories. Um, and, and again, I mean, this, this, this is a methodology talk. You know, this, the, it, our, our goal is not so much to, you know, to give you specific things to, you know, give, give you specific detailed concrete things to look for as to change the way you think about what an exploit is. I'm confident that there's other exploits that fall into a class other than those three. And I'm confident that there's exploits that have not been described before. But I mean, really, be really what it breaks down to is you've got syntactically valid, semantically valid, but, you know, semantically valid but different, and then syntactically valid, semantically invalid. And then we actually threw in confused deputy at the last minute because it was like a week and a half ago that I realized that cross site request forgery actually falls into falls under this paradigm as well. Okay. Any other pressing questions? Can I take one more? I mentioned XSLT. Oh, yes, we have. I mentioned XSLT only in <laughs> passing because I'm writing a paper on it, and I don't want one of you to scoop me. But, um, you should talk about the control characters. The control characters are hilarious. Yeah, we're out of time, but catch us after, uh, come up afterward, and I'll, yeah, we've, XML is. Short version, control characters in XML, you can change the encoding up on the fly, and then change it back. That's just one <laughs> of the problems with XML. XML is a playground. <laughs>